Hey guys, hope you're having a great day today. Today is Saturday. Happy Saturday to you. I hope that your morning is going well. My day has gone wonderfully today. Beautiful, wonderful day today. It was just like the perfect fall winter day and I'm like I need to get outside here and film today while the weather is good because eventually it's gonna all these leaves are gonna drop down and it's gonna be quite frigid so I'm up in my pool deck looking at my pool that's all green and ah, no more of that this year but that's okay because we are doing something a little bit more exciting we are reading God's Word together so this is the part of the week that we read God's Word you don't just do it today but since I film every single day and I do a little bit of scripture at the end of each video but on Saturday I like to kind of like read at least five chapters from the Bible so that maybe during the week you would read each chapter yourself and then we can come together and read it kind of add a few insights or maybe you know put something in the comments about something you read something like that just to kind of give a little bit more you know something that it spoke to you as maybe that God spoke to you about it or something that you need to work on or whatever any questions anything that I can hopefully help you with I'll do my best so we finished the book of Matthew and now we're in the book of Mark so we're reading the Gospels right now Matthew Mark Luke and John they're all they're similar but they're different because they're from different viewpoints from different people which is pretty cool because the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses that's when you get your answers so you want to know how you know if something's true or not get a witness out of the mouth of two or three get a couple different witnesses well we're gonna have Matthew Mark Luke and John and their Gospels are all gonna kind of come together and be able to give us like oh yeah this happened or oh yes this happened the good confirmation that we need so I'm reading from the amplified version um, last year I read from the ESV version whatever one if you want to do that one go go back and do the beginnings of our um, reading but I'm just doing the amplified I just like the way it reads I just think it reads a little bit nicer it gives us a little bit more words to kind of help us understand what we're reading so let's begin okay the gospel according to mark the preaching of john the baptist the beginning of the facts regarding the good news of jesus christ the son of god as it is written and forever remains in the writings of the prophet isaiah behold i send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way a voice of one shouting in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord make his paths straight John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That is, requiring a change of one's old ways of thinking, turning away from sin and seeking God and His righteousness. And all the country of Judea and all the people of Jerusalem were continually going out to him, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a wide leather band around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching, saying, After me comes he who is mightier, more powerful, and more noble than I, and I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the straps of his sandals, even as his slave. As for me, I baptize you who came to me with water only, but he will baptize you who truly repent with the Holy Spirit the baptism of Jesus. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he, which is John, saw the heavens tore open and the spirit like a dove descended on him, which was Jesus. The, the, the spirit, which was like a dove. That's the way he's describing it. Was it a dove? I don't know. He said it was like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven saying, You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased and delighted. Immediately the Holy Spirit forced him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted to do evil by Satan, and he was with the wild animals and the angels ministered continually to him. John preaches in Galilee. Now after John the Baptist was arrested and taken into custody, Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and saying, the appointed period of time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, which means to change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance, seeks God's purpose for your life and believe with a deep abiding trust in the good news regarding salvation. As Jesus was walking by the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, Peter, and Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me as my disciples, accepting me as your master and teacher, and walking the same path of life that I walk, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. They became his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his example. So when you're the disciples of them, him, 
You believe and you trust in him and you follow his examples. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were also in the boat mending and cleaning the nets. Immediately, Jesus called to them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired workers and went away to follow him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting him and following his example. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. They were completely amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them as one having God-given authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out terribly from the depths of his throat, saying, What business do you have with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, which means muzzled, silence, and come out of him. The unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions and screeching with a loud voice came out of him. They were all so amazed that they <laughs> debated and questioned each other, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, the demons, and they obey him. Imagine that. <laughs> Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere throughout the district surrounding Galilee healing the crowds. And immediately they left the synagogue and went into the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, accompanied by James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. Jesus went to her, and taking her by the hand, raised her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them as her guest. Now when evening came, after the sun had set, the Sabbath day had ended in a steady stream, they were bringing to him all who were sick and those who were under the power of demons, until it seemed as though the whole city had gathered together at the door. And Jesus healed many who were suffering with various diseases, and he drove out many demons, but would not allow the demons to speak, because they knew him, recognizing him as the Son of God. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went out to a secluded place, and was praying there. Simon Peter and his companions searched everywhere, looking anxiously for him. And they found him and said, Everybody's looking for you. He replied, Let us go on to the neighboring town, so I may preach there also. That is why I came from the Father. So he went throughout Galilee, preaching the gospel in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, begging him, and falling on his knees before him, saying, If you are willing, you are able to make me clean. Moved with compassion for his suffering, Jesus reached out with his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. The leprosy left him immediately, and he was cleansed, completely healed, and restored to health. And Jesus, deeply moved, admonished him sternly and sent him away immediately, saying to him, See that you tell no one anything about this, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your purification what Moses commanded, as proof to them that you are really healed. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news of his healing to such an extent that Jesus could no longer openly enter a city where he was known, but stayed out in the unpopulated places, yet people were still coming to him from everywhere because he was so excited. If you were healed and Jesus did a miraculous thing in your life, wouldn't you be so excited you would be able to contain it and not go hide? You'd want to tell everybody about it, right? Chapter 2, The Paralytic Healed. Jesus returned to Capernaum, and a few days later the news went out that he was home. So when people gathered together, they were no longer, there was no longer room for them, not even near the door, and Jesus was discussing with them the word of God. Then they came, bringing to him a paralyzed man who was being carried by four men. When they were unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above Jesus. And when they had dug out an opening, they let down the mat in which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their act of faith springing from confidence in him, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there debating in their hearts the implication of what he had said. Why does this man talk that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins, removing guilt, nullifying sin's penalties, and assign righteousness except God alone? Immediately, Jesus being fully aware of their hostility and knowing in his spirit what that they were thinking this, he said to them, why are you debating and arguing about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your mat and walk? but so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority and power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the mat and went out before them all. So they were all astonished, and they were glorified and praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Jesus went out again along the Galilean seashore, and all the people were coming to him, and he was teaching them. Levi Matthew called. As he was passing by, he saw Levi, which is Matthew, the son of Alpheus sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to them, Follow me as my disciple, accepting me as your master and teacher, and walking in the same path of life that I walk. And he got up and followed him, becoming his disciple, believing and trusting him, and following his example. And it happened that Jesus was reclining at the table in Levi's house, and many tax collectors and sinners, including non-observant Jews, were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many of them 
that were following him. When the scribes belonging to the sect of the Pharisees saw that Jesus was eating with the sinners, including non-observant Jews and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are healthy have no need of a physician, but only those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners who recognize their sin and humbly seek forgiveness. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting as a ritual, and they came and asked Jesus, Why are John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fasting, but your disciples are not doing so? Jesus answered, the the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast while the bridegroom is still with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is forcefully taken away from them, and they will fast at that time. No one sews a patch of unshrunk new cloth on an old garment, otherwise the, the patch pulls away from it. The new from the old and the tear becomes worse. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the fermenting wine will expand and burst the skins. And the wine is lost as well as the wineskins, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Question of the Sabbath. One Sabbath he was walking along with his disciples throughout the grain fields, and as they walked along, his disciples began picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look! What are they doing? What is unlawful on the Sabbath? Why are they doing that? Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures when David did, when he was in need and was hungry, he and his companions? How he went into the house of God in the time of Abathar the priest and ate the sacred bread, which is not lawful for, for anyone but the priest to eat, and how he also gave it to the men who were with him? Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, and he has authority over it. Chapter 3, Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Again, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. The Pharisees were watching Jesus closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him in the Jewish high court. He said to the man whose hand was withered, Get up and come forward. He asked them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with an anger, grieved at the hardness and arrogance of their hearts, he told the man, Hold out your hand. And he held it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians to plot against him as to how they might fabricate some legal grounds to put him to death. Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a large crowd from Galilee followed him, and also people from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumen, and around all the different places. A lot of people came to him to see all the things that he was doing. And he told his disciples to have a small boat stand ready for him because of the many people said he would not crowd him. For he had healed many, and as a result, all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and screamed, You are the Son of God. Jesus sternly warned them again and again not to tell who he was. The twelve are chosen. He went up on the hillside and called those whom he himself wanted and chose them, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve disciples so that they would be with him for instruction and so that he could send them out to preach the gospel as apostles, that is, as his special messengers, personally chosen representatives, and to have authority and power to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Bonagers, that is, the son of thunder, he calls them the sons of thunder. And he also appointed Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, and Nathaniel, or Nathan, which is Nathaniel, and Matthew, which is Levi the tax collector, and Thomas, and James, and Thaddeus, and Judas the son of James, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who bestrode, and I'm sorry, there was confusing, I'm seeing the parentheses. <laughs> So Thaddeus, which is Judas, the son of James, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So the, the interesting thing is he actually chose him. It says the ones he himself wanted and chose. So he already knew what he was going to do, yet he still chose him. Then he came to a house in Capernaum, and a crowd formed again. So many people that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat a meal together. When his own family heard this, they went to take custody of him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. The scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying he is possessed by Beelzebub. Or Beelzebub. Beezel, yeah, Beelzebub. Beezel, Beezel, Satan. And he is driving out the demons by the power of the rule of demons. So he called them to himself and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided, or which is split into factions and rebelling against itself, 
that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, a house cannot stand. And if Satan has rise, risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can go into a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first overpowers and ties up the strong man, and then he will ransack and rob his house. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and all the abusive and blasphemous things they say. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit and his power by attributing the miracles done by me to Satan never has forgiveness but is guilty of an everlasting sin, a sin which is unforgivable in this present age and as well as in the age to come. So whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit and his power, which means blasphemy means that you attribute the miracles done by God to Satan. Jesus said this because the scribes and Pharisees were attributing his miracles to Satan by saying he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers arrived and standing outside they went, sent word to him and called for him. The crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking around at those who were sitting in the circle, he said, here are my brother and my mothers. For whoever does the will of God by believing in me and following me, he is my brother and sister and mother. Chapter four, parable of the sower and the soils. Again, Jesus began to teach beside the Sea of Galilee, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat, anchoring it a short distance out on the sea, and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the shore, the sea and the shore. And he taught them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow seeds, and he, as he was sowing, some seed fell by the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocks, where there was not much soil, and immediately a plant sprang up, because the soil had no depth. And when the sun came up, the plant was scorched, and because it had no root, it dried up and withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil, and as the plants grew and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100 times as much had been sown. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear and heed my words. As soon as he was alone, those who were around him, together with the twelve disciples, began asking him about the interpretation of the parables. And he said to them, The mystery of the kingdom of God has been given to you who have teachable hearts, but those who are outside, the unbelievers, the spiritually blind, get everything in parables, so that they will continually look but not see, and they will continually hear but not understand, otherwise they might turn from the rejection of the truth and be forgiven. Isn't that interesting? So the parables were for the people, the unbelievers. So because it says they, that they will continually look and they'll never see. How many times does somebody hear something over and over and over and he's, they just never see it and they hear the same thing? Explanation. He said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand and grasp the meaning of all the parables? The sower sows the word of God, the good news regarding the way of salvation. These in the first group are the ones along the road where the word is sown. But when they hear it, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which has been sown in him. That happens all the time. As soon as you hear something great, immediately Satan is right there to make it not go into your head. In a similar way, in the second group are the ones who see it was sown on rocky ground, who when they hear the word immediately receive a joy but accept it only superficially. And they have no real root in themselves, so they endure only for a little while. But when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they are offended and displeased at being associated with me and stumble and fall away. So those would be, I think of, like for myself, I think of times like you go, not, not so much now, but like where you get those feelings. You know, you go to a good, um, you know, team, or not team, sorry, a good, sorry, a little tired. Like you go to a, a good preaching service or you go to a good church service and you just get all excited and all fired up. The worship's awesome. You're feeling the Holy Spirit. You get all these great things or, you know, or kids go away to like youth group and they have this great, exciting weekend of all these leaders and all these great things and all these positive God things pour, pour, pour into them. But as soon as they get back home, when things start coming, what does it say? When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they're offended and displeased at being associated with me and they fall away. Stumble and fall away. You don't want to be that person. And then others are the ones in whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries and cares of the world, the distraction of this age with its worldly pleasures and the deceitfulness and the false security or glamour of wealth or fame and the passionate desire for all the other things creep in and choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. So those are the ones that you hear, they hear it, 
but the things of the world just like so overtake everything. And I think that's a lot of people because of a lot of things that are going on. You hear things, you know things, you know what God says, you know all the things we're supposed to put into him as our trust. But all these things that are going on around in our world is what takes over everything in our mind and just chokes it so that it can't even hold ground. You don't wanna be that one. So we don't wanna be those first three, so here we're the one we wanna be, right here. And those in the last group are the ones on whom seed was sown on the good soil. And they hear the word of God, the good news, regarding the way of salvation, and they accept it, and they bear fruit. 30, 60, and 100 times as much as was sown. He said to them, a lamp is not brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, is it? It is not to be brought in and put on the lampstand. For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it would come to light. That is, things are hidden only temporarily until the appropriate time comes for them to be known. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear and hear my, heed my words. Then he said to them, pay attention to what you hear by your own standard of measurement. That is, to the extent that you study spiritual truth and apply godly wisdom, it will be measured to you and you will be given even greater ability to respond and more will be given to you besides. For whoever has a teachable heart, to him more understanding will be given. And whoever does not have a yearning for truth, even when he, what he has will be taken away from him. So you want to have a teachable heart. Have a humble heart. That's hard. Because our world is so put into that, like, no one's going to tell me what to do. And no, I'm not going to be let people push, not, not that people are pushing you down, like, feel like people, like you're being put down because you're not. Humility is surrendering yourself. Surrendering yourself to what God has for you. When you can do that with all your heart and put down the whole, like, I deserve this. I was treated badly. I don't deserve to be treated like that. I should have justice. No, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Let God have the revenge. Let God have the justice on the things in your life. You humbly submit and let God do the work. When you have a teachable heart, God says that he's going to keep giving to you. Even more understanding will be given. And you're yearning for truth. He's going to give it to you right and it's to be measured to you and you'll be given even greater ability to respond and more will be given to you that's what you want parable of the seed then he said the kingdom of god is like a man who throws seed on the ground and he goes to bed at night and gets up every day and in the meantime the seed sprouts and grows how it does this he does not know the earth uh, produces crop by itself first the blade and then the head of grain and then the mature head grain in the head but when the crop ripens he immediately puts in the sickle to reap because the time for harvest has come the parable of the mustard seed. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use to illustrate and explain it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it's sown on the ground, even though it is smaller than all the other seeds that are sown on the soil. Isn't that funny that the mustard seed is the smallest seed on all the earth? Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than any other garden herb and puts out large branches so that the birds of the sky are made to make nests and live under its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke with the word to them as they were able to hear and understand it. And he, did, and he did not say to anything to them without using a parable. He did, however, explain everything privately to his own disciples because he knew the other ones were the unbelievers. He knew the ones that they needed to hear the parables, right? Jesus stills the sea. On that same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So leaving the crowd, they took him with them, just as he was in the boat and other boats with him. And a fierce windstorm began to blow, and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep, with his head on the sailor's leather cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're about to die right now? And he got up and sternly rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down as if it had gone weary. And there was at once a great calm and perfect peacefulness. Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no confidence and faith in me? They were filled with great fear and said to each other, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? 5. The Gerasene Demonic They came to the other side of the sea to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And the man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with chains. For he'd often been bound with shackles for the feet and with chains, and he tore apart the chains and broke the shackles into pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue and tame him. 
Night and day he was constantly screaming and shrieking among the tombs and on the mountains and cutting himself with sharp stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him in homage. And screaming with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have in common with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, swear to me, do not torment me. For Jesus had been saying to him, Come out, the man, you unclean spirit. He was asking him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began begging him repeatedly not to send them out of the region. Now there was a large herd of pigs grazing there on the mountains, and the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, that we may go into them. Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out of the man and entered the pigs. The herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and they were drowned one after the other in the sea. The herdsmen that were tending the pigs ran away and reported in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the man who had previously had the legion of demons, and they were frightened. Those who had seen it described in detail to the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them all about the pigs. So the people began to beg with Jesus to leave their region. As he was stepping into the boat, the Gentile man who had been demon-possessed was begging with him, asking that he might go with him as a disciple. Jesus did not let him come, but instead he said, Go home to your family and tell them all the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he obeyed and went away and began to publicly proclaim in Decapolis, the region of the ten Hellenistic cities, all the great things that Jesus had done for him, and all the people were astonished. And we were for the sunshine. Miracles and healing. When Jesus had again crossed over in the boat to the other side of the sea, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue's officials named Jairus came up and seen him, fell at his feet, and begged anxiously with him, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will be healed and live again. And Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed in around him from all sides. And a woman in the crowd had suffered from an hemorrhaging for twelve years, and it had endured much suffering at the hands of many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. She had heard reports about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his outer robe, for she thought, if I just touch his clothing, I will get well. Immediately her flow of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body and knew without any doubt that she was healed of her suffering. Immediately Jesus, recognizing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? His, so meanwhile, there's probably a ton of people following around him, right? There's probably a lot of people, but he immediately recognized that power was flowing through him because he immediately recognized that there was a person there that had faith of that. His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in around you from all sides and you ask, who touched me? Still he kept looking around to see the woman who had done it. And the woman, though she was afraid and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith, personal trust, and confidence in me has restored you to health. Go in peace and be permanently healed from your suffering. While he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue's official house, saying to Jairus, Your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher any longer? Overhearing what was being said, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid. Only keep on believing in me and my power. So don't be afraid. I think that's the key word for everything. Don't be afraid. Only keep on believing in me and my power. So even though he had reports that she had died, had all these things happen, but he said, do not be afraid. Only keep believing in me. And I think that's for us to do in our lives is too, is especially when you're going through things that it's like that's a test of your faith. Is like the first thing you want to do is start doubting. You still want to start getting afraid. You want to start thinking, what's going to happen? What am I going to do? What am I going to eat? Where's my next paycheck going to come from? What am I going to do about my relationship here? What am I going to do with my house? What am I going to do with my job? All these things. When you start doing that, you're working and so searching in on that fear. Don't hone in on that fear. Jesus says right away, he says, stop and do what? Only keep on believing in me and my power. So you need to do that. This week when you're going through things and immediately stop yourself. When you want to start worrying, stop and go, oh, no, 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 no. What did Jesus say? He said to only keep on believing in me and my power. We only keep believing in me and my power. We know he's got the power to do it. That's where our focus is at. And he allowed no one to go with him as witnesses except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official and he looked with understanding at the uproar and commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing and mourning. When he had gone in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but she is sleeping. They began laughing scornfully at him because they knew the child was dead. But he made them all go outside and took along the child's father and mother 
and his own three companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child's hand, he said tenderly to her, Talitha, come, which translated from Aramaic means, little girl, I say to you, get up. The little girl immediately got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they, who witnessed the child resurrection, were overcome with great wonder and utter amazement. He gave strict orders that no one should know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. Powerful scriptures right there. Powerful, powerful scriptures right there. The importance of what we need to do. Jesus has got some healing powers, right? Healing from sickness, healing from diseases, healing from everyday things. We just gotta, we just gotta tap into that. How do we do that? Oh, we gotta do that. We gotta do it because we gotta trust. I think that's line right there that don't be afraid, only keep believing in me and my power. When you know the power that Jesus has, when you like believe these things that you're reading, the power to heal, the power to you know, do all these things that he's doing, you know, get the demons out of people, all these things, when he has the power to do this, if you believe him that he'll do that, you trust that beyond a shadow of a doubt, oh, nothing can stand in your way, and then start watching the miracles happening in your life. It's pretty, pretty exciting. So, all right. So hopefully you enjoyed today's reading. We're getting some good insight here. We're reading some good things, learning about Jesus' power and the things that he's able to do. And the, th the great thing is we're going to keep reading as we learn more about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says that, and Jesus is going to be saying that, well, I'm going to go now and I'm going to send somebody even greater to you. And it's going to live inside of you so you can do these things. You can perform these miracles. You can have these powers that I have as a man on this earth pretty crazy. We're going to get to that, but that's going to be exciting. So let's pray and then you guys can go about your days. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this time to come together and read your words, Lord. The words that are written in this book, Lord Jesus, that are words that are, are written for us for reproof and for correction, Lord Jesus. Help us to get these deep inside of us, Lord. Let us keep hearing things and be reminded of these things. And, and when we're faced with things this week, like the fear, the doubt, and the worry, Lord, help us to go right away and go, oh, no, 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 right away. We're going to believe and trust in you and the miracles and the powers that you have. Let us not doubt the things in this world that, that are coming on around us. All the things that are going on around us, Lord, help us to go right away. Nope, not even going to focus on that. When we hear that little glimpse of news, nope, not going to focus on that. When we hear that not realizing we don't have enough money to pay the next bill, nope, God said he's going to take care of all my needs and things in my life. All these things, Lord, help us when we start getting the reports of the sickness, reports of health issues, reports of, you know, family situations. Just let us go right away. No, no, no. We're taking what God says. And what God's word says is to not doubt and to put our trust and faith in him because he has the power and he has the ability to do it. But we are the ones that need to focus on him, Lord, so that he can do them. Lord, help us to focus on you this week, to not even give a... a even give a glimpse to the devil on issues going on in our life and always to keep our mind focused on you so that we can start seeing the miracles and things happening in our life, Lord. Excited to see the great things you're going to be doing in our lives, Lord, and the people that are listening and the things that you're going to be doing in their lives, Lord Jesus. Lives change. Marriages restored. Finances restored and fixed. Healings and bodies restoration, Lord, restoration in so many things in our lives, Lord, Father God, praying and believing for restoration for so many out there, restoring all those things that the enemy has taken out of their lives, taken it the wrong way, taking those things back because they rightfully are owed to us, Lord. We're trusting and believing in the great, wonderful, miraculous powers that you have that we're going to be able to tap into when all we do is believe and trust in you. We love you, Lord, so much. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so you guys have a fantastic, I'm talking fantastic rest of your day. Hopefully it's a beautiful fall day at your house. We'll see how the day is. Hopefully it's not rainy. Hopefully it's a good fall weather. Enjoy them. And I will see you guys again on Monday for another video. So we will see if you need a church, you can go check out my church, Upward Christian Fellowship. That's the one I go to. I attend there each Sunday, worshiping along together and just a great place where you can build community, get taught the word of God, learn some new things, connect with other people, especially even online. Even though you're miles and miles, hundreds of miles away, you can still connect with other believers online. It's a great place to be. And then I'll see you guys again on Monday. All right, we'll see you. Bye.